Jason over there. Welcome to the crew. It's got Brenda, got Tracy, got Pedro, got the others signing in. I think we're ready to go. So at this time, I'm going to call this meeting to order. So we can go. Okay. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, just cover a couple things. I know that we've got uh, Commissioner Hall on the meeting. So I'm just going to go over a couple few things. Um, so uh, this is a very interactive session. Uh, so feel free to jump in wherever uh, you have a question um, or a comment, especially when we're in the presentation, because if you're raising your hand, uh, we may not see you raising your hand. And so just feel free to jump in. But most importantly, uh, we just want to make sure that the board members are able to participate fully in this meeting. So if you experience any technical difficulties, uh, please feel free to text me um, and I can uh, have us suspend the discussion uh, if necessary. So next, we just need to call the roll call. Uh, please indicate if you are present. Mayor Ronald Pappas. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Brenda McMillan. Present. Commissioner Jason Hall. Present. Commissioner Pedro Mori. Present. Commissioner Tracy Westlick. Present. And Commissioner Ann Simpson. Present. All right, all members are present. I'll turn it back over to you, Mayor. Very good, thank you, Melody. All right, for this is the Board of Commissioners work session, virtual meeting, December 8th, 2020. We are in order, so I'm gonna immediately turn it over to the business side and uh, we'll start off with uh, Jeff and his team. So Jeff, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor, and good afternoon, everybody. Happy Tuesday. And uh, we are continuing to roll through our land development code reviews. And today we're going to feature chapter 10 and chapter 12. We did have the very last bit of chapter eight to go over. And if we have time, we'll finish that up. But I figured uh, we could always uh, wrap that into some other, uh, the back end of some other discussion, but wanted to make sure that we had uh, most of the time to discuss signs and historic preservation uh, today. And so, Madison Miller will be leading you through uh, these discussions. And of course, I'll uh, certainly uh, chime in uh, as, as needed with any questions and things like that. Uh, but wanted to give Madison the opportunity to uh, shine today as he is uh, the primary author of both of these uh, chapters. Uh, Blair is not with us today. Uh, he had uh, a little uh, something that he had to take care of uh, today. But uh, he hopefully will, if we get through these two chapters, then uh, the next chapter we'll get to will be chapter six, design standards. And that's one that uh, Blair was the primary author of, and he would lead us through that one. So with that, I'll let uh, Madison take us away and start us on uh, chapter 10. Madison. Sure. Hey, Jeff. Yes. Here. Jeff, before before we get going, I have a, a question, um, and I really kind of hate to step back, but it goes back to the trees. Back to the trees. Yep, we can go back to the trees. <clears throat> so the question I have where it talks about maintenance and ownership, and I know that um, part of the planning that it would designate like in developments, street trees and things like that um of what what the requirements would be and where they'd be located on on the plats what happens if a resident or a a tree was was removed by a resident on their property that was supposed to be there what's what type of action happens we have the ability to require them to replace it you know if we know that 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 situation does exist. I, I think in, in the code, <clears throat> and you're testing my knowledge of where that exact paragraph is, but if I'm remembering, uh, we give them, I think it's six, up to 60 days once we discover, uh, if we ever discover that that is an issue, if there's something that's missing either by, um, uh, if it's failed in health, if it's died, something like that, or if they cut it down and we discover that, 
then uh, we give them an appropriate amount of time to be able to rectify that issue. Just to be clear, if I was a homeowner and part of the final plat for my development said that I had to have a street tree on my property and then whatever the reason it was disease damage, and I see it's right here, it's 8.12 paragraph D, that if it was D, if it was, I guess, identified that it was supposed to be there per the, all the plats and everything like that, then we would, as the town would go back and notice them to replace it? Yes. Okay. But opening that up a little bit more since we're on that. So Anne had uh, mentioned that if it was part of her development improvement to get that, what about trees that are not part of a development, you know, on any given town street or anything like that? Tree is there, homeowner wants to remove it. They can remove it. Okay, that's what I wanted to make clear. Thanks. You're welcome. All right, Madison, you ready? <laughs> yeah, no, I was reading through the tree section. So um, let me share my screen. Can you all see the chapter 10 signs? Yes. Okay. Is that a good size for everybody or would you like it to be a little bit bigger? A little bigger, please. A little bigger, okay. Better? Okay. All right. Well, diving right into two signs. Um, I had the pleasure of drafting the majority of this. Um, so with our sign ordinance in our current UDO, it was something, it was not uh, content neutral. And so one of the biggest things coming into writing our new LDC, specific the signs, was ensuring that it was content neutral where it wasn't calling out particular signs for what they were. So for example, we wouldn't have regulations for church signs or for, um, you know, like specific signs for like daycares or anything. It wouldn't be specific, but it would be specific to the size, location, um, type of sign versus like wall sign versus monument sign. So we really corrected a lot of that with our, our sign ordinance before, before diving in. So, um, so you can see here, the purpose and intent is um, anything that is erected, altered, or maintained as of signs. Um, it allows for effective signs for communicating um, identification of, of businesses or uh, uses that are located within the town. And so the intent is to protect and enhance the view of properties, um, avoid distracting, confusing or misleading signs, um, avoid interference with protected free speech and commerce, and then ensure that these signs are permitted properly to avoid um, wrong permitting of location of signs or just them being a hazard or nuisance. And then to add to the positive visual impact um, of these signs. And so the regulations of this chapter will apply to the placement, construction, erection, alteration, uh, replacement, maintenance, use, type, quantity, location, material, size, and height of all exterior signs within the planning jurisdiction of the town. And so um, for definitions of these signs, they had once been located here within our ordinance, but we, we moved those, relocated those to our uh, chapter 13 definition section. So kind of how I mentioned in the very beginning, um, we have a section about content neutrality. This pretty much states that we have uh, done our best to ensure the content is neutral um, as it refers to uh, commercial and non-commercial speech. Um, and that's what that subsection here. And this is pretty routine of new sign ordinances. So getting into the computation of sign measurement, um, this is pretty much what defines the sign area. So it's the area of a sign um, within the smallest polygon that will encompass the extra limits of the writing, representation, emblem, or other display on the sign that can reasonably be calculated. 
Um, so the area shall also include any material or color formatting or forming an integral part of the background. So for example, like an Aldi sign, um, they have the kind of blue and gold color and that would be a, a part of the sign uh, computation area because that's kind of part of their, their logo and their, their appeal. Um, and so frames are structural members. Um, so if you have a large monument sign, the bricking of it will not count as the computation, but the message itself within the, the brick would be, would be that. And then it shows a, a graphic here. It's a little blurry with this. It's usually a little more uh, less pixelated, but um, that's something that we can adjust as well. Oh, and then it mentions the computation of height and how that's how that's uh, measured. So exempt signs. These are all signs that are exempt from the requirements of this chapter. Um, in some instances, building permits may be required for some of these exempt signs, such as electrical permit. So warning and security signs um, placed on utilities um, will not be, uh, they are exempt from the sign, so they will pretty much means they will not need a sign permit and follow these sign regulations. So any government signs uh, or signs for nonprofit organizations, signs for athletic fields, scoreboards, um, or internally oriented signs on athletic fields, vending machine, ATM, gasoline pump or other similar signs. So these are the, the incidental signs like the numbering of gas pumps um, that they usually have. Yes, you have a question? Well, um, yes. So I'm just going to refer to some things that um, we had when I was on the Board of Adjustment. I remember a case where it was the sign for Waxhaw Elementary. It was um, an illuminated sign and because it was in the a residential area, they had to ask for a variance. So now is this giving schools an exemption by saying government signs, would schools fall under that? I don't think so um, from what I've, from my understanding. Um, so the, I think also the intent of that was um, the type of sign and its location too. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't think schools would, have, would apply to this as far as government signs. Okay. So now we have the portable A-frame signs. These are your common signs that you see at like a sandwich shop where it shows like the daily specials of the day. Hey, Madison, um, can I jump in for a second just to clarify that a little bit? Sure. A little bit more. Tracy, it's specific to, to signs that, that are informational, directional, wayfinding top signs, things like that. Yeah. For, for a school sign there, I mean, that would be permitted like any other freestanding side would. And if they can't meet the the requirements of the ordinances determined by the zoning administrator, then that would be where they would have the option like they did before to get a variance. Okay. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, Jeff, and, and also, uh, isn't some of that county property? For what instance? Well, a sign on school property, would that not be county property? I think it the property be, was, yeah. It, but they would not be a, a freestanding sign for a school that's got internal lighting would not be one that's got legal notice or an informational or wayfinding type sign. It's a different type of sign and that's what would be exempt as opposed to the freestanding sign for the school. But Pedro, is your question jurisdictional? Is your question that whether or not the town has jurisdiction over a county property? Uh, that's in part. Uh, for example, there was a thought to put up a sign at one of the local schools and the question came up whether do we have to follow the town sign ordinance or a county sign ordinance being that the sign would be on county wow. property. You yeah. would have to follow the town sign ordinance because it's in the in the town's jurisdiction, yes. Even though it's county property? Yes. And so, um, so we have flags as well. Flags will not, are not a, a required to follow this ordinance. Um, you have holiday sports and goodwill decorations. Um, then you have signs for temporary uses, uh, the uses that are defined in chapter four. 
and then a directional and identification signs. So these are signs that display the address, um, directions within an internal site, um, including signs for restrooms, entrances or exits, and then no trespassing signs. Madison, can I drop back to article F on flags? Are we talking specific flags? Generally, we talk about federal and state flags in this instance. Um, does this mean they could have a school flag 60 feet, 60 square feet in area and put it on their roof? Um, so this is just, I think just all flags in general um, from residential to um, the flags we have outside of town hall. It's just not specific to um, one or the other. I think we need to clarify that because I don't know that many people would like to have, you know, a flagpole in their neighbor's yard with a big, um, you know, find, find a flag that's been offensive lately and put it on it. I'm, I'm used to seeing ordinances that are exempt or rules that are exempt for the federal, the U.S. flag for the city or the state flag but any other flags would come under a sign rule. Is that what you think uh, we're leading to or do you want to clarify that, Jeff? Yep, yeah, I think that would be, I think that would be okay to add in. Jeff, you were muted. Oh, my apologies. Um, yeah, no, that, that's supposed to be specific to US flags, state flags. Uh, oh. As, as you mentioned before. So we'll make that clarification. That's a good catch. Yeah, let me jot that down. Thanks guys. Okay. Anything else before I move to uh, prohibited signs? Okay. Um, so these are all signs that are not allowed um, at any extent within the town limits. Um, so signs which constitute a hazard to public health or safety, roof signs or signs that extend above the parapet of a building, so the, the top wall of a building, animated flashing signs, um, off-premise billboard signs, um, any signs that people may place on utility poles, hydrants, bridges, trees, um, signage that's affixed to a motor vehicle, a boat, trailer. Um, so this just means that you can't park a, a van with your advertisement on a parcel for more than 30 days um, as an advertisement tool. Um, so electronic message boards are not, pro are, are not allowed in the Main Street Neighborhood Center and then our residential zoning districts any signs which may obstruct um, access to fire escape, to doors, windows, or other entrances or exits. Signs other than governmental signs, which contain lights, um, rotating disc, words, um, and other devices not uh, erected by a public authority. And then we get into even pennants, streamers, balloons. Hey, um, Madison? Yes. Question I have and I have it here is what about neon signs? As something that government could put up? No, I have First neon. Thing. Is that something? I mean, do we want to? What is surrounding like neon signs? I, I mean, I did see somewhere in, in a different section that talked about neon signs inside a window. I mean, would you, do we want like, like neon signs outside of a building that would be flashing or I'm just, I just have neon here that I jotted down. Yeah, I'm thinking of like a neon, if they have like an open or closed neon sign or if they have like a sign that says like best burgers in town. I imagine that being on the interior would be okay. Um, well, should something be, something be listed like no exterior ne neon or I mean, I, I don't know. I just wanted to throw that out there and we can see what everyone else thinks. Also, I can think of right now t as an example is sort of like the movie Cars when they're driving down into the city and yeah. you see all the flashing lights. And I mean, that's... Yeah, yeah I mean, if um, everyone's comfortable with as far as 
um, adding neon signs. So I don't know how, I guess as common as it is now to place neon signs on the exterior, but. Well, you've got the animation in the flashing covered is prohibited. So, you know, regardless of what type of sign it would be, um, you know, like animation could be anything from, uh, you could think about the, the cowboy that's waving, you know, in Las Vegas, yeah. something like that, or uh, uh, any, any type of, of flashing sign, unless really the only type of signs that should flash would be the ones that are the informational highway type signs, like the one that we use, our police department uses sometimes, and Parks and Rec uses to notify the public of such things. But uh, pretty much anything else now, um, I think it would be appropriate to place something in there, as, as Ann mentioned. Um, and you only, you know, you only allow that within the windows uh, for neon. And of course, it again couldn't be animated or flashing. I think that would be appropriate. Well, I, I know, like on on a couple of pages when we get to it, they have a a theater marquee sign, which you know to look at it, it's all vertical, it's all like in neon, and, and that's kind of what I'm envisioning. I mean, you know, if we want to have a certain look and feel of our town. Would we want to have allow, allow that type? Again, I'm not opposed to having something in the window that says open or something on an interior that shows out through a window. Just on a facade might be a little too much. Well, one of the things I want to just for clarification purposes, I mean, some some brands have neon signs on a backboard, you know, so it's part of the sign, part of their brand. Do we want to consider that or are we just saying no exterior neon period? Or the went other. quiet. Yeah. <laughs> I think at some point we're going to have to consider it on a case by case, no? Yeah, I, I think I would give, you know, someone the latitude to integrate it in because there's going to be some, I mean, I can, can't really think of, you know, a specific example, but there's going to be some that might be a very well designed, very appropriate sign, but the lettering might be neon because of the era in which it might represent. So. You know, it might be nostalgic or something like that. So you had a, a 50s diner, you might want a 50s diner type of sign, but maybe it isn't freestanding neon, it's within a background, a frame, brick, whatever. So I would say uh, to Pedro's point on a case by case, or at least give uh, the latitude by the zoning administrator, at least uh, to make a decision. I think you have the safeguard. I mean, the biggest concern is it's, it, some kind of motion or animation or flashing or something like that, it's already prohibited. So, you know, we have that safeguard in, in place, regardless of whether it's a neon sign or, or any type of sign it could be. I mean, that would be specific to, uh, to electronic message board signs as well, or, you know, any other type of motion. Um, well, like, you know, back in the Back in the 80s when I used to go eat at the Shoney's Big Boy restaurant, you know, and the, the guy had the big hamburger and he was, you know, moving in circles. So, yeah, I mean, it, it, it restricts all those type of things as well. So, I mean, if, I mean, I'm, I was gonna say, I'm not necessarily opposed to neon. I just want to make sure that we have a certain look and feel that we don't look like a Las Vegas if people want to come in <laughs> with that style of sign. Big that's that's. Heroes. Yeah, I think, I think it'd be okay as far as if we wanted to add a zoning administrator may approve specific neon signs, but I think um, if even if they're mounted behind something that might be more internally illuminated to where it's not as bright or as, um, I don't know, as, you know, Las Vegas, Vegas E, as you would think. Well, we can also regulate the, uh, the brightness of it, the lumens of it, whatever. Mm -hmm. Well, so what we can take from this is we, you know, we we can try to craft a little sentence here, I think, to cover our basis here. And then when we, you know, go back through the final rundown of all the little changes we've done, we can we can uh, rediscuss that one and see if what we've come up with makes makes sense to everybody. Fair enough. Um, if I could just add, I, I mean, I was going to touch on this when we got to that chart um, that you have later on. 
but is is that kind of where there, it talks about illumination in the different zoning um, sections, like you know, where it says it'll say external or internal. Is that kind of in that same description there? I'm talking about this. Um, it's a, it was a it's a chart ten thirteen point two. It's on our page two thirty nine. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That one right there. So. I don't know if any of those. I mean, one says wall signs, but I don't know any of these. Does any of that apply to what you're talking about? Are you just talking about freestanding or? Yeah, so I think what I'm meaning by that is, so here you have the internal um, mm -hmm. as far as the, the layout of the sign. So external would be like you have a, I imagine like Millbridge, Millbridge or Curitan have where they have a light shining up onto their sign. Okay. Um, yeah, as far as like internal specifically, this is what um, the difference is as it kind of explains. Because I just, I mean, I had a complaint from a, a resident that lives near downtown from some of the, um, now that certain things had been cut down on off of Providence there, uh, off Broom Street, that now they could see illuminated signs and like I'm not seeing residential listed in um, some of those in the permitted location. So that's why I'm just wondering if maybe when we get to that section, we can talk about that a little more. Sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah. So let me go back up. Let me go into back in. So let's see, where did we leave off? Um, okay, so I think we're here. Um, so feather flags, ribbons, inflatable signs, spinners. Um, a lot of these, when a new business may open, um, they may place these out front, but we're um, kind of similar with our current ordinance. We're not allowing those. Do you have a question, Ann? I did. Where it says spinners, do you mean like one of those people who stand on the street spinning the signs? I imagine that's what that's that's meant to be as far as like, because it's a, a way of advertising for signage. So. Yes, I think they mean pinwheels. Or, or, or are you talking like a windmill type sign that would blow with the wind and spin? Um, hmm, pennant streamers, balloons, feather flags, feather flag. I would think you're referring to the spinners they being you know, a pinwheel type, like yeah. a pinwheel type of sign. Yeah. Those are, are pinwheel type signs that have some spinning features to it. So I don't, sorry, I was double tasking here, looking at back at the lighting section to kind of help with Tracy's questions when it comes up, but um, uh, carry on, Madison. Yeah, um, we might want to just add in there and pinwheel spinners just to be more specific because that can be kind of up to interpretation. <clears throat> um, so point K for exempt or uh, prohibited signs. So this is any sign or flag the zoning administrator deems to be significantly worn, torn, dilapidated, damaged, uh, tethered, or otherwise in disrepair. Um, signs displaying obscene, indecent, or a moral matter. Madison? Yes, Ann. My question was, and I know this sounds really crazy, immoral and i just kind of wrote subjective so what one person considers immoral somebody may not do we need to, to expand upon that or is there a generalized definition in the back yeah i don't think we had defined immoral matter um we could just simply say um science displaying obscene or indecent matter and just kind of leave out immoral um if that kind of covers it I'm fine with that. It's just, it's just some people, some people might consider things that, I mean, what I consider immoral, you may not, or yeah. vice versa. I guess that's just that term. No, that's, that's another great, great catch. Um, that's another thing that we can, we can just make a slight change to. And the morals of the zoning administrator may be different, right? <laughs> Yeah, um, Jeff, hey, it's um, 
Jason, um, you actually bring up an interesting point there that I had on the previous one on K, where the zoning administrator deems to be significantly worn. So with respect to a flag, because um, this is the only one that specifically calls out the flag, um, what is significantly worn for a flag to be um, taken down um, by a zoning administrator? It would be a judgment call of the ZA. And, and it, it, it's the kind of thing too that that it, it's not something that, you know, if we're, if we're out and about, you know, that we're hunting for things like that, it would almost certainly be some kind of complaint based type issue. You know, if somebody says that, uh, uh, you know, our, our, our neighboring property, you know, has a, has, has a situation like that, then we would go out and, and uh, do that investigation and then make that call. It would be very difficult to define that specifically. Great, thanks. And then finally, we have signs erected or displayed on or over public street right of ways, um, other than those erected by governmental agencies. Um, and then, the, so these are talking about appropriate encroachment agreements um, must that be executed um, pursuant to this code. So that's it for prohibited signs. Um, now we're going into historic building signage. So I think a lot of this was kind of copied over from our current sign ordinance. Um, so this is applicable to the, the wall signs on historic buildings. Um, with the exception of, of some signs that may have been approved by conditional zoning or will be approved. So the location, um, wall signs on historic buildings shall be placed on the fascia or horizontal band between the storefront and the second floor, um, often referred to as the, the sign board or sometimes called the sign freeze. So this is just the general area above, um, if you have a storefront above the the initial windows and door, but below the second story uh, windows. Madison, we have a couple of hands up there. Tracy? Okay. Yes, um, so this is another one that was brought up in a, a Board of Adjustment meeting before. Um, and just to clarify, so when it talks about the, um, the sign board, is that part that we have on the historic buildings where like one says hardware on it, um, I can't remember what the, there's another word too on one of them, but we were counting that air. Is that the area they're saying to put the sign in? Like you would actually be covering up that historic lettering on the building, or are you talking about above that? Um, so if I'm gathering that correctly, so if you like a older historic building, some may have like the painted across. Right. Um, so I think that's typically where they're, they're talking about as far as the location. Um, I don't know if, what was the particular case with the Board of Adjustment? I think, I think it was the, um, the real estate one there on the corner had put the sign on the wrong place on the building. And then mm -hmm. um, the reasoning I think was because they didn't think they should cover up the lettering that was painted on there. And I remember it had to be, we, we, they had to move the sign and change the size because of that. Um, and I, I remember a lot of us on the board at the time were questioning whether or not that should be in the code just because you're kind of covering up some of that historical feature of the building. So. I didn't know if that was something that we wanted to discuss if we felt like that should be covered up or not, but. Yeah, was, I think if, you know, if some buildings have that on there, have uh, the historic painting of letterings, um, I think, especially working with HBC, I think HBC would enjoy that, our Historic Preservation Commission. If we add a note where um, existing lettering from, um, or existing building lettering from, I don't know, his, historic or from 
Um, the original time period of the building shall be preserved and location of sign may be placed elsewhere. Something a little more technical than that. It sounds a little more professional, but something along mm -hmm. the lines of that. If I think it might be an, also on a case by case basis there, yeah. depending on the architectural element that they're looking at, because not all the buildings are going to have this exact space on on the front. Right. right. Uh, some of the buildings do have uh, a nameplate or something painted up in the parapet wall above the second story. Some of them, uh, you know, have a, a brick ledger or something between the first and second floors where you, you, you couldn't put a sign. So I would uh, I would probably say uh, kind of blend in the uh, HPC with this and uh, get their recommendation as well. I think I think you have to be pretty flexible on where it goes. Yeah, and, and just another thought, you know, some of the businesses there have those hanging signs that, you know, come off the wall and whether or not we should to just require that all be like that rather than having signs placed on the building. I mean, I don't know what anybody's opinion is on that, but I, I think a consistency with the types of signs makes more sense. Well, I think, uh, you know, to that point, Tracy, I think it's good thought. Uh, I, there's such a variation on these, uh, you know, blade or protecting uh, projecting signs that they're not consistent. And I guess if I was going to use an example of consistency, I'd probably look at something like our wayfinding signs. Those are all consistent in their look throughout the city. So I wonder if we should maybe consider some type of consistency if they're if we're going to continue with these blade signs. I'm looking at your example on 238 on chapter 10 there, the blade and projecting signs. And I wouldn't necessarily, that looks like it's on the old Nivens building there. And I wouldn't necessarily say those are historical in nature in their design. They look uh, in some I'm cases more like, like, like Maxwell's has, has a sign that hangs off, I believe, and Mona's right down from that. That's kind of what I'm talking about. It doesn't look like we have a picture of that, but I don't know. Just a thought. Well, going forward, I think I think you're right. I mean, we should get some kind of consistency if we want a certain look downtown. And uh, some of these were, like I say, 60s things that I see hanging off all over the place. So, uh, Madison, you got your work cut out for you again. Well, yeah. and we, we can check with Charlie as far as, I guess, the, the legality of, of, of trying to, to dictate like a specific type of um, design, I guess you could say, of, of a projecting sign. Because, um, you know, you want to allow projecting signs town wide and you wouldn't want to have the same consistency downtown necessarily that others would would need to have in other locations, but I mean, it is a good thought process to see if, if that could be an option uh, in the downtown area. And we can, we could look into that specifically and, and, you know, we can look into that option uh, as to not having any additional signs on the wall other than what you know, might already be there historically, as we talked about with uh, some old lettering or things like that. Uh, I, I think we can we can look into all those uh, options, or at least at the minimum, like we talked about, if we do still allow them on the wall, I think you do uh, uh, work with them to, to not, uh, to avoid any situations where you have um, some existing lettering that you'd want to keep because of the historical nature of it. So and you give that discretion to uh, the zoning administrator. So, you know, I think that's probably the way to go at a minimum. And then, you know, we can look at uh, the other options as far as, as uh, maybe having some kind of consistent projecting sign look through the downtown area. And what I just as a further that thought a little bit, mainly what I was more looking at is the arms that come out of there. The signs may be brand related, the sign that itself, but how it's attached to the Hardly. building is what I was looking more to try to manage that. Mm. Okay, well, I got you. Yeah, we can do that. And Jeff, just, just to kind of piggyback on that too, since the, I think the the areas that we're talking about really is like Main Street area, can we just confine some of that to the Main Street district? Because it's really just within kind of that section of town, I think, where where those lettering is over the, the I mean, it's on South Main Street. So, I mean, could we just kind of put that, re, 
that caveat just for the zoning district into the Main Street area? I think you can specifically for the Main Street district. That would make sense. And then, and then it would add more flexibility in other areas of town, depending on what gets done, because we want to preserve that history and that look and feel yeah, of that, our downtown. That was, that was basically where I was talking about, because we were looking at the, because we're in the section of historical building. So that's what I was talking about was just that Main Street. Me too. All right, we can do that. Yeah, good dialogue. Thank you. Something else that I kind of when we started going here and we we're talking about historic building signage, what about if there's a mural on the sign? Like I think the Belk building, doesn't they have the Belk sign on the logo? Or, you know, maybe someday there was an old Coca-Cola sign on the side of a building. What yeah. about does that any of that get dressed in here? So or if they want to like restore something to that. Yeah. So we um ironically in our old UDO, we had murals as part of our signage, but they're not really like necessary signage for, you know, dictating a, a building uh, or a business. Um, but we do cover um, murals or public art in chapter six. Um, so we kind of moved it from here and then moved it to chapter six because um, it's really not specific signage um, that we would want to kind of govern in this section, if that makes sense. Yeah, this, yeah. this is treated as informational type, you know, directional signs, all that good stuff. Where that, we're, we're classifying that more into the public art category and, and hence move that into the design standards. Yeah, I was just thinking of like the old historics, you know, like we see like the old Coca-Cola signs or that had been painted on, on a, as a mural on an old building, or I think the Belk building has, has Belk on the sign. Sure, that was a good point. All right, let's see. Um, so here we cover, moving from historic buildings, we talk about obsolete or abandoned signs. So non-conforming signs or signs serving a vacant building or site that have not been used for 180 days um, shall be deemed an abandoned sign and shall be removed. Uh, so signage supporting structures and frames used to support non-conforming signs may remain in place. So let's say if you have a, uh, a monument sign where you can change out the face you just remove the face of the business once the business has moved on and the the sign structure itself will remain um, and then obsolete or abandoned signs may be re removed by the zoning administrator within 60 days of notice to the owner at the owner's expense um, Non-conforming signs, as we kind of mentioned above, this will be governed in our chapter 11, uh, non-conformities. Um, so something that we, we added here, the master signage plan. So a master signage plan shall be submitted to the town for developments containing one principal structure with over 10,000 square feet or any multi-tenant development. Um, so this is where they will coordinate the styles and colors. Um, same type of material may be used for attached and freestanding signs. Um, all types of attached and freestanding signs shall pr produce a unified theme and meet all area and height requirements. Um, a master signage plan will be required to include the following guidelines. So before I get into the guidelines, the, I guess the best example of this would be um, kind of downtown where the Pelicans is and the new skate shop, they have a master signage plan to where each new tenant gets a matching, I believe it's a black and gold signage where it's conforming um, and designed throughout the whole building. Madison? Yes. I know here it says with a principal structure of over 10,000 square feet. What about if it's like, as an example, where the new Bojangles is, and that's like a whole area in there, wouldn't that want to have a certain identity, look or feel, or even look at Prescott? I mean, I know here this is related to a building or a structure, but what about a certain plot of land? Certain plot of land. Um, I think that could be done as well, as long as they're, the applicants are comfortable with following that or the developer is okay enforcing that. Um, as far as styles and colors. 
Um, so I think that's something that could be done as far as a either conditional district rezoning where, um, you know, like the Bojangles and the Aldi and all that stuff, they have a matching sign um, sign plan. We can reword that, Ann. I, I think that's a good thought, you know, to have, well, for, for in that case, Carrington Square, um, you know, they do have some unifying themes there, particularly on their uh, freestanding sign and then some of their other uh, usage of signs, but then they do still to a certain extent maintain their own ability to have their own um, uh, style and, and, and logos and theming that they have. But I think there's some room there to, to add some kind of consistency there for, for a singular development there that may not necessarily be just multi-tenant, but could be multi-building. We can, we can. And, and that's, that's kind of the point that I want to get. So if you, if you have just like Carrington Square, I mean, I'm not, I, I'd like each individual, I know they have to have be branded in their logo and things like that, but to have some sort of uniformity where we're requiring it here to, to make sure it conforms to some higher standard. Yeah, we, we can do that. You know, the main thing we're wanting to avoid is, well, like, you know, we're, some of us are sitting now in the shopping center at the food line where you've got uh, just, different style signs through all the, the leasable spaces. And when you have a shopping center like this come along again, that you require those unifying themes. I mean, you're not wanting to try to, to, uh, to go as far as restrict people or, or developments from being able to have their own uh, logos and, and their own branding, but you wanna have some consistent themes and the styles of signs that you have. So you don't have, uh, you know, one sign is not, uh, uh, a channel sign and the next sign is just a metal sign and, and et cetera. Well, I mean, if you want to use this, this um, plaza as an example, I mean, look at, at the restaurant out front here, the out parcel. I mean, you'd want some conformity within that whole boundary, I think. Yeah, that, that's correct. And that's exactly what I was thinking is maybe that's one of the things that we add in is add um, out parcels as part of that to be consistent with the other main buildings. And that's the point that I'm making because this specifically states a structure is 10,000 square feet, whereas we need to kind of encompass that whole per, um, perimeter. Very good. We got it. Um, let's see where to leave off. Oh, so the guidelines. Okay. So a, the maximum square footage of wall signs shall be 10% of a single wall area. Um, there is no limit on the number of wall signs as long as the maximum square footage allowed is not exceeded. Um, only permitted freestanding signs to be used uh, shall be a monument sign. Detailed designs of the proposed signs, including size, height, copy materials, and colors. Um, they should show the proposed number and location of signs should outline a sign illumination plan and then show provisions for shared uses of freestanding signs as the, the larger monument signs that you see for like Curitan and Carrington Square that we just kind of mentioned. Um, so a master of signage plan will be a part of any construction document or civil plan submittal required for development and shall be processed, processed with it. Um, and then a master signage plan will be approved prior to the issuance of sign permits. Let's see. Okay. Madison, if I could back up on that one on G as well. When we talk about any development, maybe the assumption might be the MPCs or something like that, but we're talking, are we tying that to um, definitions of uh, subdivisions or so? Five lots or more, five lots or less beyond that? Is that what your intention was? You said for, you said for G. The definition, yeah, the definition on G, you got required for development. You know, development is a, a, a loose word there as far as I would yeah. thinking if you're talking about a master plan community like Millbridge versus a five unit subdivision or four unit subdivision. Yeah, I think, um, I think the intent of this is just for commercial development, not so much residential um like the millbridge or curatins of the world um so maybe just for um 
for the commercial development um, versus having that open-ended. All right, yeah, just either um, retail slash commercial development, something that would identify it other than a, an MPC or something like that. You nope. can make that clarification that it's for uh, uh, non-residential plans. Yeah. Uh, so two more. A master of science plan may be amended by filing a new plan, uh, which complies with all the requirements of this code, um, provided that the new plan is accompanied with necessary processing fees. And then after the approval of a master of science plan, um, no sign will be erected, fixed, placed, painted, or otherwise established, except in conformance with the plan. Um, and the plan pretty much will be enforced the same way as any other provisions of this code. Um, and then all requirements of this chapter must be met unless otherwise stated in this section. So is sign permit required? Um, a less exempt uh, in the section earlier, all signs will require a sign permit uh, in conformance with this code. Um, whether the sign is new, a part of new construction, or an existing sign, the following information will be required as a part of the permit application. Um, so they will need to describe the new sign, um, including the drawing, showing the size, height, and the site location. Um, Existing signs must meet these requirements. Um, for any reason, the sign is to be changed or altered. So normal copy changes in routine maintenance matters um, are exempt from this requirement. So just general maintenance um, is okay and would not require any additional permits. And then some signs may require building and electrical permits as determined by the building inspections department as many signs do. So here, as we've seen before, um, we tried our best to use some example of signs as they relate to Waxall. So you have your wall sign examples of the Mary O'Neill's here, and then the wall sign for Emmett's. You have your window and door signs, um, which is this decal or sticker here that was placed. Then you have your awning and canopies. Um, theater marquee sign, which could not find an example here in Waxhaw, unfortunately, but um, then we have our blade and projecting signs as an example here, which this image has changed because the, the Union County Chamber was a bit blurry. Madison, this is Jason, just a question back there with the theater marquee signs again. Sure. That's that's actually a very good example. Um, and it comes back to some of the things that um, Commissioner Simpson and Commissioner Westlake were talking about with respect to neon. Yeah. So are we, are we saying something like this would be allowed then? Well, I think um, depending on, on how we phrase it or what we do, um, as far as, um, as far as it goes, um, so I'm trying to remember what we had had because we talked about may approve neon signs on a, on a, a case by case basis. Um, so this might be something that we could permit depending on the language that we add, because I think this is a, a good example of a, you know, mention of like a 50s diner. This is kind of historic to the gym theater in Kannapolis. Um, so um, How well? What about in terms of if something like that we would restrict it in certain zoning districts? Like you wouldn't want something like that maybe on Main Street per se. So we've got well, actually, it in, in ten thirteen. It's a, attached sign standards. It's it's D. It's theater marquee signs, and now we've got it as a permitted location to say theaters only, and, and that's how it's restricted there. So you know it would only be for that specific type of use you wouldn't be able to do that with any other any other type of use so it'd be specific to you know if we ever had anything or i guess we're lucky enough to have anything similar to the gym theater i mean that's where you would put that 
but you couldn't put that for a uh, Waxhaw Diner, for example. Well, I'd, I'd want to go back on that, as we said earlier, at least I had made the comment earlier about, you know, it might be a, a period or a thematic type of sign. So if you did have a diner, a 50s type diner in any area, really, it doesn't necessarily have to be restricted to the downtown area. But I mean, I think I'd want to have those period uh, signage type of um, flexibilities. I don't, I wouldn't say we'd restrict it because same thing like we're looking at on 239, where you say the theater marquee sign is only for theaters and it could be for a 50s diner as well. So, you know, give yourself some latitude and there's some flexibility. Uh, I think what we're looking for on these neon things is not just to have a freestanding glass only neon type sign in the middle of the boulevard. Yeah, and I think we can add something for the diners and stuff like that. I think you just have to differentiate it out from the, the theater because you may not want a diner sign, for instance, to be that big. Um, so I, I think that's where you'd have the differentiation there. Yeah, so one of the issues with that is, so when we say a diner sign, that's content and we're not allowed to specify as far as a particular sign. Um, now, the theater marquee sign is is unique. Um, and so we kind of kept that, but we, we couldn't specify as far as um, a diner. We could specify kind of the location and size and the type. Um, so that's really, we haven't gotten to that part yet, but it's difficult to define a lot of these things without getting into content as far as it relates to signs um, specific to churches, diners um, of the sort. Tracy, yeah. I saw you had your hand up. Well, so I just, I'm looking over this chart and so it looks like neon signs are only allowed as window and door signs in your chart, right? There's not, it's not like we're talking um, the up in the air signs or anything, right? We're not allowing that as a neon, it doesn't look like, if I'm reading this correctly. I had that highlighted too, because it says neon lettering on window signs. Uh, it's the last column under B. Yeah. And I think again, <laughs> we gotta go back and give ourselves some flexibility on period type signs. And so if we're gonna be thematic on anything certainly in the downtown area, it may be appropriate. So I, I wouldn't box yourself in, but I think what we're looking for is you know, an example like this theater marquee sign, it's framed, it's got a backboard behind it. It's just not a bunch of neon tubing stuck in the air. Yeah, and, and I can look and see if we can kind of frame it in a way to where we kind of keep um, period specific neon signing or, or something specific in the downtown to where we can allow that and have the flexibility. Um, so that's definitely something, probably one of the bigger points thus far that I'll have to go back through and, and kind of see what's pretty common as far as uh, allowing that, but also remaining content neutral. But, but my yeah, question is, areas. Uh, go ahead, Tracy. Well, I was just going to say, so if we're not talking about, I think you're the, on it's um, well, 242 on my page, but the post and arm signs, and the pylon signs, I'm assuming those are the signs that are up in the air, right? And so those don't look like they have neon allowed for that type of sign. And I think that's what I was most concerned about that could be very distracting to residences around the downtown area. Um, okay. So I just wanna clarify, right? Those cannot have, they're illuminated, right? But they're not neon. There's a difference in that, is that correct? That's correct, yeah. yes. Okay. No, but that, that is a good point about the neon. That is a, a great point to, to bring up. Um, so I guess this would be considered the heart of the sign ordinance. Um, so this is what regulates the size, the height, um, as far as number and, and then additional standards as it pertains to um, specifically attached signs here. Um, so we gave the examples on the, on the page before. Um, so this kind of goes over, um, so let's say wall signs for a neighborhood center or corridor commercial. Um, you can have an area of 10% of, 
of a wall area per elevation. Um, so no sign shall exceed above the roof line. And then it goes over um, single tenant building, um, less than 10,000 square feet, and then single tenant building over 10,000 square feet. And then additional standards, talks about the 12 inch protrusion um, outward. And then it talks about may not exceed maximum calculated square footage. Um, and the allowed types of, of illumination are external and internal. Um, so this is kind of consistently the theme for attached signs and what we will go over in freestanding signs. Um, so let's go like even windows and door signs. Um, so this will be allowed for all businesses and all districts, excluding home occupations. Um, so you can do 50% of a single window or 30% of the uh, gross glass area on any side of the uh, first floor. And then so you don't really have any heights or number because you're going based off the percentage. Um, and then as Ann mentioned, the signs shall not be illuminated except for neon lettering on window signs. So that's more like the open and closed signs that you, that you typically see. Um, so this is, kind of the meat of the attached signs. I don't know if, if you guys had any questions about these in particular um, before I kind of bounce uh, to freestanding signs. Okay. Seems like you're clear to go. All right. So similar to freestanding signs, um, this one actually did better because it included examples of signs here in Waxall. Um, so this is your typical residential monument sign here for Millbridge. Um, you have the Curitan, and then you have your examples of post and arm and a pylon sign. So um, it's kind of similar format. Um, so we broke it out into residential monument signs versus non-residential. So for residential, then all places were a, uh, a person could live, um, which are R1, R3, R4, our neighborhood center and employment center. Um, you have a maximum sign area of 32 square feet. And so this is just specific to the message itself. Um, so so for, for Millbridge, the sign area will be where it says Millbridge, has a little bridge, and then the the kind of the coloring of it, which kind of contribute to the sign area. So that would be 32 square feet. Um, the maximum height will be six feet. And so six feet is for now seeing it is specific to the size of the monument sign. So the from the ground to the top of the sign could be six feet. Um, so you could have two signs per uh, major entrance. And then here go goes over some additional standards like um, five foot minimum setback, 10 feet minimum setback. Um, no sign shall be located in any required buffer yard or within 20 feet of any right of way intersection. Um, you can't have a, a ground mounted sign within 50 feet of another sign. And then when located on the same parcel, there should be a 200 feet separation distance. Um, so the intent of this is to make sure that um, in any chance um, there's not signs back to back to back. And then illumination types are, are listed here as the two. Um, so non-residential monument signs is, is roughly the same. Um, they have a little bit larger area size. Um, so for a multi-tenant development, you can do 150% of the required sign just to give it a little more area for, for visibility for signs for businesses. Um, maximum uh, height of eight feet. And then you have one per street frontage. Um, and then, like I said, for the multi-tenant, please see the master sign plan. And then the additional standards are the same. And then illumination standards are the same.
and then here it's the same for uh, posts and arm signs and pylon signs. So I guess before moving on to temporary signs, are there any questions for this? No? All right. So temporary signs, um, this is where we really see the content neutrality of it, where we're not giving names to specific signs. Um, so for any temporary signage for our, our R1, R3, and R4 zoning districts, um, they will follow the standards below. So such signs shall not exceed six square feet in area. You can have two per street frontage, um, shall not be located within the street right away or site distance. We don't require any maximum duration. Um, and then temporary signs shall not be illuminated. And um, temporary signage serving a little lot shall not be required to obtain a temporary um, administrative permit. So temporary signage for new developments greater than 10 acres, um, they will follow these below standards. So it's 32 square feet in area and 10 feet in height one per street frontage, um, very similar, no, not located within a street right, street right away or a distant, a site distance triangle. Um, such signs shall only be allowed during the time such construction or development is actually in progress in accordance with a valid building permit or when lot is for sale. Um, and then temporary signage serving on new developments greater than 10 acres will require a temporary sign permit. So a lot of these were kind of similar in our UDO, but we changed them over in a language to make sure that it's not talking about content. And just a little bit of quick history on that, you know, for the content neutrality, the reason behind that is there was a federal Supreme Court case uh, had to do with the city in Arizona and uh, the, the, the findings of that case is, is what has caused uh, pretty much the entire country to you know, have to, to shift over to make sure that their ordinances are content neutral, just to, to make sure they're within the precedent of that law or that, that determination. Jeff? Yes. Would, would um, temporary signage be like the for sale signs that you see that are all over the place? Yes. Yes. Yep. So the, the temporary signage here that are six square feet are your, um, you know, um, favorite candidate signs or um, my child is a uh, Cuthbert in high school senior, you know, signs like that. It's where we're not specifically calling it out, but we're giving the, the kind of requirements for those. And what about like street right of ways? Because I know like political signs, they can go in right of ways. Yeah, so I think that's, that's mandated or controlled by, um, as far as code enforcement, I think the state where they allow them during a certain time. And I think we do the same thing for the town or, or did. Um, but I'm not sure as far as um, allowing those in NCDOTs right away where most of them are located. But going back, just to clarify, when we talk about real estate signs, I don't think that unless you guys tell me different, we're getting permits for somebody to put up a for sale sign in their yard. No. And that's what I want to be clear on. You know, the temporary signs are you know maybe an event sign or something that may go on for a period of time or something like that but uh, real estate sale signs certainly not a boards that's covered somewhere else for directional for say an event church event something like that those are pretty portable uh, i can guess maybe if we had an event and we had a a, a two-week circus event and they wanted to put up signs i would imagine this would be uh, an area where that temporary signage would come under. Is that correct? Yeah, so we'll get into um, kind of some of that with the temporary signage as it gets out of the residential areas. 
Um, so we'll try to, to cover that. Well, I think just having this discussion here just goes to show maybe some lack of clarity on what, what covers a temporary sign. Uh, okay, so temporary signage for um, neighborhood center, main street, town center, corridor commercial, and employment center. Um, so they are follow up subject to the following regulations. 32 square feet in area, uh, two, for, two per street frontage, um, shall not be located within a street right away or sight distance. Such signs, signs may remain in place on a lot for up to 45 days. This period may be renewed by the zoning administrator up to a maximum of three times per calendar year for additional 30 day periods. Um, so such signs may take a form, take the form of a banner, pylon sign or similar configuration. So I think that um, may have covered some of your, your question about, you know, if we have a, a two week circus they need to put up temporary signs. Um, so this kind of covers it as far as like the, the size limitation um, um, or a sign type actually. So then we have temporary signage for new developments in the following district, the districts. Um, shall be no greater than 32 square feet in area, six feet in height, you have one per street frontage, um, shall not be located within the street right away or sight distance. Um, such signs shall only be allowed during the time such construction or development is actually in progress in accordance with a valid building permit or when the lot is for sale. Um, temporary signage serving on new developments greater than 10 acres will require a temporary sign permit. They shall not be illuminated. Um, temporary signage that exceeds six square feet in size shall require a temporary sign permit. So that's for that's for new development, all that. So the sign illumination, um, external illumination uh, must be confined to and directly solely um, directed solely at the surface of the sign and shielded to prevent beams, glare, or rays of light from being directed onto any portion of the right-of-way or adjoining properties. Eternal illumination, the only allowable types of eternal illumination are channel letters, reverse lit channel letters, or push through acrylic sign panels. Um, for reverse lit channel lights, uh, letters, it must be white. All exposed raceways must be painted to match the finish of the wall behind the sign. And then black raceway is suitable on brick walls. And here um, is actually an image that we use from our UDO. And it talks about those in a little more detail um, as far as internally illuminated. Um, channel letter is probably one of the more um, most popular. And then you can see here um, internally illuminated cabinet signs. These are the big signs that just illuminate pretty much all the sign. So those are prohibited in all zoning districts um, just because of the amount of illumination that these signs produce. Okay, so getting into digital displays. Um, digital displays are limited to LEDs or LCD boards and shall meet the following restrictions. So they cannot um, contain a message that flashes, pulsates, moves, or scrolls. Each message must transition instantly. Um, the minimum time between display changes shall be three seconds. Um, here is, it shows the brightness of the display. Uh, as far as our limits during the day and then during the nighttime. Uh, digital display shall not exceed 50% of existing freestanding signs. And then in any case of malfunction, um, they must be set to the default design um, to freeze it in one position. 
and the neon tubing, neon illumination shall be installed in the interior doors and windows. Um, so this is something that, like I said, as we discussed, we'll take a look at. And then all wiring to freestanding signs or to lighting equipment erected must be underground. And then additional illumination shall meet the lighting requirements of our chapter eight, where we talk about the lighting. Section 10 is the administration. Um, except for signs expressly exempt, no sign may be constructed um, without an administrative permit. Um, any person proposing to erect any sign um, must submit a, a permit to the administrator, uh, must show the, the plans um, as far as the light plan, the way it's gonna look. If the work associated with a permit is not completed within six months, um, the permit will lapse. And then finally maintenance, um, all signs including exempt shall be maintained to a satisfactory state of repair. Um, so this just talks about maintaining the signs that to, to keep that aesthetic of the town. Um, I think that's it for signs. I can definitely get where your voice starts to, starts to hurt a little bit, Jeff. <laughs> Madison. Yes. <laughs> And after or in, in, in maintenance, and I don't know if there should be a section added afterwards. So it says shall be maintained. Who determines if it's not being maintained? Well, I, I know we have some definitions here. Who determines that? And then if it's not maintained, then what? Is there going to be fines? Is there going to be fees? Is there some sort of hearing? What's the process if it's not being maintained? What's next? Sure. Um, so I think we could add something, maybe um, maintenance shall be or uh, signs shall be uh, seen and reviewed by zoning administrators as far as their maintenance. And we could always add um, a sentence about violation as far as them falling um, our violation standards, I think that we have in our administrative section. Um, uh, and so I anticipated, uh, I'm sorry, Madison. Uh, and I anticipated that that question might come up. I, I think what we'd do is we'd reference uh, violations in chapter three and then go by that process. Okay, I, yeah, I just think that we should have something there. What's the next step if the maintenance and people, you know, what's the next consequence if this isn't being followed? Maybe it needs to be 10.18 violations and then refer to chapter whatever. Yeah, I think that's yep. exactly what we would do. And, and, you know, just to give you some context to what the process would be, you know, somebody calls in a complaint or we notice something, uh, go out and inspect it, determine if it's a violation. Uh, then the letter gets sent out to that property owner. They get a, a certain amount of time to remedy the situation. You know, that, that's the typical, typical process. And then if they don't, uh, within a specified amount of time, then you can go into uh, civil citations. So is there any further discussion um, for signs before I move on to historic preservation? Mayor, uh, board, do you need a quick break or do you want to carry on? Quick break. A quick break, how about give us about uh, seven minutes? Okay, very good. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks everyone.
All right, we're getting close. Got one more vacancy there. So we'll hang on two more vacancies there. So we'll hang on for a couple of minutes. All right, looks like we're all back in. So continue on. Madison, the floor yes. would be yours. Yep. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, let me get to chapter 12. Um, can you enlarge it? Yep. So chapter 12 is specific to historic praise of preservation as it relates to the designation of landmarks, the establishment of a local historic district, um, certificate of appropriateness for these landmarks, and then also demolition by neglect for landmarks. Um, so this chapter, um, it's kind of one of those chapters that we didn't necessarily really touch a lot. Um, so a lot of the, the standards in this section are from the new North Carolina General Statute 160D, or we um, move them over from our, our current uh, UDO. Um, so a lot of this is, like I said, kind of already established by the state. Um, and so we just pretty much copy and paste it or maybe even simplified some of it from the state requirements and then some things that that exist in the UDO that we kind of liked and, and kind of worked as far as the function of historic preservation in the town. Um, so I can go ahead and start with that as far as we move forward. Um, so the the purpose and the intent of this um, talks about the value and an asset of the historical heritage. Um, so it's the con conservation of historic properties um, will stabilize and increase property values in the surrounding areas. And so by means of recognizing, regulating, and acquiring historic properties, the town seeks to safeguard its heritage um, by preserving any property that shows historic significance um, of culture, architecture, history, or prehistory, and then to, pro to kind of promote the use and conservation of such district or landmark for the education, pleasure, and enrichment of local county and state residents. So um, section 12.2, the designation of landmarks. A lot of this, um, I would say 99% of this section is straight from uh, North Carolina General Statute, um, specifically 160D-945. Um, so moving through it, uh, the designation of landmarks, just kind of a broad overview before I uh, dive into the details. So the designation of an additional landmark um, is something that you all will, will approve. Um, so the Historic Preservation Commission usually recommends the designation of a landmark for a structure or a property. And in between there, um, a report is written to prove the significance of it. It's then usually reviewed by the State Historic Preservation Office. Uh, within a certain amount of time, they either support the recommendation or they just add in their own comments. Um, then it will ultimately fall to you guys to kind of um, adopt a, a local landmark designation. Yes. Okay, so this might be a good place just to ask, um, do we have a list of landmarks that the HPC has already designated? And could this be something moving forward that this board might want to consider asking them to uh, relook at other landmarks um, or you yeah. know, do, direct them to, to, to go out and seek that? Or I don't know where we're at right now in our landmarks. Yeah, so we have the, the existing four landmarks. So we have the, the water tank, the pedestrian bridge, um, the Waxhaw Women's Club or the Belt Building, and then the um, what we call the Cockanose Building, which is um, the Waxhaw Antique Mart um, and portions of that little shopping area of downtown. 
So from the past, we've taken a look at, I know um, the McDonald house that the town owns. And then also, I think they even looked at the Niven Price building at one point. Um, so those weren't in consideration um, because the State Historic Preservation Office said that they are too different from their original status when they were um, constructed in the early 1900s. Um, so they wouldn't really qualify for landmark status unless extensive exterior modification was done. Um, so I think as part of the HPC or Historic Preservation Commission, that's definitely something that um, you could ask them to do to kind of find more properties that would be um, contributing or that we would want to make or designate as a local landmark. Because um, there's a lot of historic buildings um, in general that offer significance. The, the only downfall to doing a landmark is the expense. Um, usually drafting a report for, um, for proving significance, you're getting a, a consultant involved. Um, and so usually a, a private property owner isn't wanting to, willing to do that, but you know, it's um, something that is always open for discussion as far as kind of pointing out those, um, those properties or structures that could be deemed as a landmark. Okay, well, it's just something that I'd like to suggest to the board while we're discussing this, something that we talked about when we discussed zonings as far as protecting historic property. Maybe at a future meeting, we should discuss whether or not we wanna direct the HPC to um, look into further landmarks that we could designate to give an option for us to protect some of the properties. Yep, um, just okay. following up on what you're saying um, is in, instead of just directing, directing them to look at certain properties, um, would it be best to then just ask them for a report of what they have done thus far, what they are up to, what they themselves are looking into and get an idea of where they are. And then if we have suggestions moving forward, move forward with that. Yeah, this is and Jason. Fine. I'm I just gonna, didn't know if, if, if they- I okay. agree with uh, Commissioner Westluck and Commissioner McMillan. I, th that echoes what I was talking with uh, Commissioner Simpson about earlier today. So I think that would be a valuable approach to, uh, to get that listing that was brought up. I could make this suggestion that that be a, a, a retreat topic. Uh, that could be good. Give uh, the, the HPC uh, a, a meeting or two to be able to, to pull that together and have it prepared uh, for the board in that venue. Yeah, because one of the, the the reason for us having a historic preservation commission is specifically for landmarks. So in order to to have a landmark, you have to have um, the historic preservation. So they're they're statutorily required to be here since we have uh, four wonderful landmarks in town. Just just to to add this and and per our current UDO and the historic preservation, which is chapter 19, it does state that every year the HPC should be sending us a report by March 1st. So I actually spoke with Jeff early and requested that. So hopefully we can get the, the last five years of reports that um, per the UDO, they're supposed to be giving us to the board so we can see kind of what their activity and what they've been up to. And I think the retreat is also a good idea if we can have some information by then as well. Yeah, and let me just uh, back that up a little bit as well. Just one of the, as I see it in B, certainly all of the elements have to be met. And one of the more important ones that we can do all the directing and surveying and, and all this stuff, but without the cooperation of the property owner, it doesn't happen. Is that correct, Madison? That is, that is correct, yes. And is that a statutory requirement? Um. So I think in order to designate a property as a landmark, um, you're, you're gonna have to have property owner permission because once you establish a structure as a landmark, um, any exterior modification that's, um, that's major um, would require a certificate of appropriateness, which is something that I'll also cover as we get farther into the chapter. Um, so it's, 
you know, they, they kind of lose the flexibility of, of being able to do stuff with the structure if they, if they own it. Um, but it kind of promotes it of the significance of the building as it becoming a landmark. So, I mean, it's, you got a way as a private owner, you got a way that kind of the benefits of, of having it being a landmark. But my question then, is that just something that the town puts in the code or is that a statutory, a state law as far as the property owner agreeing to that? I think state. section it's D. state statute. It's state statute. It I haven't seen it. statute. Point. The property owner has to consent. That's correct. Sorry, I was trying to talk when I was on mute again. I apologize, but it is state. It's state law. Just, just a question here, Madison. Do you know if the old hotel next to Sonoma Salon is a landmark? Because I know there's a plaque in the street. So is that considered a landmark? It, it is not. Um, so when back in the 1990s, when we established our National Historic District, um, the State Historic Preservation Office did a, a survey of kind of all the properties within like a downtown area. So the way that the district was established was dependent on the amount of contributing historic structures. Um, so likely it's probably a plaque that says something like, um, this property is located on the National Registry of Historic Places. Um, and this a plaque is awarded by the Department of Interior or it probably says something along those lines. So it, it is not a landmark. So there's a difference between a landmark and a property that's on the National Registry of Historic Places. So the National Registry, go ahead. I was gonna say, so if it's a landmark, so this section would not have anything to do with anything on the National Historic Registry, just would us being able to designate something a landmark within our municipality? Yes, yep. So most of the requirements in here, um, as far as certificate of appropriateness and demolition by neglect are only pertaining to landmarks. So the four landmarks we have, the I call it the COA, the certificate of appropriateness and the demolition are, that's that's pretty much the, the biggest portion of the section. So, um, so I guess going over this um, for the designation of landmarks, the BOC may adopt um, an ordinance designating one or more historic landmarks. The code shall describe each property designated. Um, so they'll list the name of the owner of the property, the elements of the property that are integral to um, its significance um, for each building, structure, site, area, or object to be designated. The ordinance shall require that the waiting period set forth in the section be observed prior to its demolition. For each designated landmark, the ordinance may also provide for a suitable sign on the property indicating that the property has been so designated. Um, and then it lists, you know, if owner uh, consents to sign, may be placed on property, if not near the right of way. And so this is this is explicit language from. Um, 160D. And so bullet point B, whoops, um, talks about the property owner's consent deemed and found by the HBC to be special, um, to have special significance um, in terms of these particular um, attributes. Section C, um, no ordinance designating a historic building, structure, site, area, or object as a landmark, um, nor any amendment thereto may be adopted, nor may any property be accepted or acquired by the HPC or the BOC until the following procedural steps have been taken. So it's a bit wordy, but once again, it's, it's been copied from 160D. Um, now I will um, preface that um, before I go over this, from our unified development ordinance, it had included bullet points three, four, five. So at one point when they drafted the UDO, they had added this language. Um, so as I propose now, after a, a quick talk with Jeff, 
we think we're going to strike bullet points three, four, and five as far as it pertains to the ordinance. So going starting with number one, um, the HBC shall prepare and adopt rules or procedures and adopt uh, standards consistent with state law of this chapter for altering, restoring, moving, or demolishing properties designated as landmarks. So this is our um, Waxall uh, historic design guidelines that we have. So this is the document that we're talking about here. So this is the document we use when they do a facade improvement grant. This is what helps guide, um, you know, if someone's replacing their vinyl windows to ensure that they're wood, they're appropriate to the time um, and, and all, of, all of those are similar to that. So number two, the HPC or property owner shall make or cause to make an investigation and report on the pretty much the significance of the building. So this is the report that I had mentioned that um, the property owner will take upon himself to get a consultant um, to do, to submit to the state office and then to submit to you guys to review. Um, so this talks about the specific parameters of the report. Um, and then mentions that it shall be submitted to the um, North Carolina Department of Cultural Resources, which is the State Historic Preservation Office. Madison? Yes. I did make a suggestion to Blair, and I'll just pass this along here, is that since this involves a pros process, it'd be really nice to put a graphic like we did in the zoning, like the zoning step process, some sort of graphic that, that depicts what, how this process goes out visually. Yeah, for sure. I think this chapter is a lot of text. So even having a graphic will help break up some of that text as far as someone um, wanting to read it. Um, so I think that could very easily be done. And Blair has already another. updated uh, chapter five based on that same comment. And, and it, you'll see the end product uh, you know, a little bit down the line. It, it looks really good. So we can- Yeah, do and I think- I was going to say, there's another part in this chapter two with another process, and I think if they can do a graphic there. Too. Okay. So, um, bullet points three and four and five, I'm not necessarily going to go over because we're, we're going to remove those from the ordinance because um, it makes more sense as well. Um, so now number six will become the new number three. And so this says that the state historic preservation officer um, will be given an opportunity to review and comment on the report. Um, any comments shall be provided within writing. And so it gives the state historic preservation office 30 days um, upon receipt with the department to um, provide feedback. So the new number four will be uh, the HBC and BUC shall hold a joint public hearing or separate public hearings on the proposed ordinance of designation. Um, so reasonable notice shall be given. Um, all meetings shall be open um, for the open meeting law. So the new number five will be the following, following the joint public hearing or separate public hearings, the BUC may adopt the ordinance of designation as proposed with any amendments deemed necessary, or they may even, or you may even reject the proposal ordinance. So once the adoption of the ordinance has taken place, the owners and occupants of the landmark shall be given a written uh, notification. Um, one copy shall be filed with the HBC, um, and then the other with the Union County Register of Deeds. Um, so each designated landmark shall be indexed according to the name of the owner of the property. Um, a second copy of the ordinance shall be filed with the town clerk and be evade, available for public inspection. Um, and then a third copy will be given to code enforcement officer. So then upon adoption of the ordinance, um, shall be the duty of the HBC to give notice to the county tax supervisor. And once again, straight from 160D. Um, and so 
that's that's it for um, local landmark or landmark designation. Um, so Madison, yeah, uh, with the Union County Register of Deeds, basically what they do is they. Uh, I would take the ordinance to be recorded, but they wouldn't actually be keeping it, keeping okay. the copy of it. So essentially we could just do two copies. I don't know if you want to adjust that or not. Yeah, I mean, we could simplify it. I mean, make it make it easier. Thanks, Melody. You're welcome. So I'll actually make I, it that. I have a, um, a couple of other things here, and I'm not sure where, where this may go before we get into the next section here of districts. Is I know in, um, and I wasn't looking, I've been looking in 160A of the state statutes, and it lists the qualifications of having a um, HPC member, as well as the minimum amount of members on there, and what their powers are. And I don't see that addressed here, and I know we have it in the current UDO. Is that something that we should put in here? Yeah, so the the powers of the HPC are listed in is it chapter two of our ordinance? Chapter um, two. Yep. So it defines all of their um, responsibilities and duties, and so those are reflective of 160D. Um, with is that something that maybe we should just maybe make a heading in here and say for their powers and for their how it's made up and just refer back to chapter two. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, that'd be be very easy to do. We could add it at the, the very beginning before the designation of landmarks. Yeah, we can add we can add a short little thing there. So Madison, can you go back to 254 for me real quick? Yeah. This is 254, Whoop. this page. Okay, yeah, no, I was just checking on in item B, 12.2B to make sure, because in, in mine, it's it refers to it as the commission, but I see you've updated it to, to HPC. So so that's good. Yeah. Yep, no, it, it wasn't very clear between the commission of HPC or the commission of board of commissioners. So we've, we've updated that ahead of time for, for our versions at least. Yeah, and just for a little context on that, we, we go through this stuff before we go live and we say, oh, okay, you know, what do we think they're going to have questions on? And then we catch those things and we've, we've gone ahead and updated as many of those things as we can. So now we, we caught that. We're like, oh, okay, I, I think that that's going to be confusing to have just listed the commission um, there. And so we differentiated out, you know, HPC, BOC. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I actually read this three times in order to catch on to that. So it's good yeah. that that's updated. <laughs> um, so I think I can cover um, historic districts. It is a very short section before um, we have to adjourn it at six. Um, so historic districts, this is something that, that you all will for a local historic district, this is a designation that you guys would would vote on and be the decision for. Um, so this kind of outlines the process for that as far as adopting a local historic district. Um, so this language does not match up 100% with 160D, but it's something that we had in our, our UDO that kind of um, it's a more understandable version uh, that we have of it. Um, so 12.3.A, so historic districts established uh, shall consist of areas where deemed to be significant. So procedure for designation, um, the HBC shall determine whether, whether any areas within zoning jurisdiction of the town possess the character of a historic district um, if the HPC makes a determination, it sh shall cause to be made an investigation report describing the significance of the building, structures, features, sites, or surroundings um, included within that proposed district. Um, and so they kind of, kind of very similar to 
um, the local landmark, they kind of start the investigation and then they, you guys will be the ultimate uh, decision makers on that. Um, Madison? Yes. So on this, um, under B, it says the commission or the HPC shall determine. And in the old, um, in our current UDO and in the 160 statute, it says the HPC will investigate and recommend. I mean, when, when we use shall determine, to me, that sounds like they are the sole decision maker. And I just want to make sure we have checks and balances in there. And, okay. you know, okay. shall determine, is that the only, is that the last authoritative piece of that? Whereas if they're investigating and recommend, then yeah. I think they should. I think that language just needs to be adjusted. Sure. So we could do the commission shall um, recommend or. Investigate and recommend is how the current statute is written. Okay. As you follow can up. Can I just ask, can I just ask why was it changed from the current UDO to the way that it is written here in the LDC? As to why it changed or why we, we added it back? Why you no? Why you made the wording changed um, that Commissioner Simpson just referenced? Why was that wording changed from the investigation to shall recommend? Um, so what I did, I I think I had just deleted that original sentence and then started with the second sentence. So I, I can very easily just add in the investigation and recommendation by Historic Preservation Commission because it was like a half half sentence. I mean, it wasn't very clear or establishing anything, but I could add that sentence back in and have it be more clear. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty clear in the later part of that section that the BFC has the, the final authority, but I, I, I think that it's fine to move back to the beginning of it and, yeah. and make sure that we make it clear that they are the recommendation body as well. I think that's fine. Well, we're just making it consistent with what's already there and what's law. Yep. Yep. So bullet point two. Um, so this is very similar to landmark designation where the report will be sent to the State Historic Preservation Office. They have 30 days um, to kind of offer feedback um on the report and then so it says in 160d that um well let's see the hbc shall make copy the report available yeah so i think it also states that other boards or uh, governing bodies may review and offer feedback so here we have it shall make um the report available to the planning board who can also make comments and as Jeff just stated, uh, the bullet point C, they BOC may, um, as part of an ordinance enacted um, in this chapter, designate and from time to time amend one or more historic districts within the zoning jurisdiction of the town. Um, so it talks about treating the historic district as a separate district. Um, when historic districts are designated as separate use districts, the ordinance may include as uses by right or special uses those found by the HBC um, to have existed during the period sought to be restored or preserved or to be compatible with the restoration of the district. Um, so that's pretty much saying that. Yes. Um, but someone have a question? Yes, I do. Yes. I have, um, I'm not quite sure which one we're on here right now, but if you, went to number two under B, B2. It says the, the commission shall cause a copy of this report. In, in, the, in the current UDO, it's a, it's, it kind of starts off, it would be reviewed by the Department of Cultural Resources as opposed to the, the HPC. Yeah, that's, a, that's another kind of sentence that I had deleted because the rest of the paragraph states um, be provided to the Department of Cultural Resources. So I thought I was just redundant. Um, but like I said, it, I can add that back in as well. Okay. 
and then um, proposed changes to the boundaries of the designated historic district must comply with the requirements of this chapter. Um, so like I said, it's, it's more of a, a user-friendly chapter versus what it states explicitly in 160D, but um, this outlines kind of the, the procedure for a local historic district. Um, so I think if, if we have uh, any more questions. I just want to make it clear though that there's no change in the process as to what we've currently yeah. always had. Right, and let me uh, let me ask a question to see if there were any changes between the two. When we're looking at uh, at C in this uh, historic district section, uh, would not uh, that have the same uh, the board of commissioners would have the same weight as section or paragraph eight in sec the section before it? Uh, it doesn't seem to flow from what happens after these first steps, and then it just says the board of commissioners may as a part of an ordinance and act, wouldn't you want to say in there, you know, you want to lead in that making sure that the approval process went all the way through. So the board of commissioners would then have the um, requirement to approve or deny uh, bringing in this district. Yeah, we can make those two consistent. That's a good suggestion. Thank you. And we're at uh, 559 right now. So any hands up on this section or save it until the next time? So, um, Brad, I can't tell whether your hand's going up or you're just moving around. No, it was going up, but I'll save it until the next time. Write it down. You have, you have <laughs> I <question>. did. <laughs> all right. Are we all in for the moment? Because we're getting at a hard close time here. So. If we're all in at the moment, no other questions that I see any hands up right now, we are going to move to adjourn this meeting and don't even have to have a motion. How about that? So we'll see you on the next screen. Thanks, everybody. Bye, everybody.